Our first scripture reading today comes to us from Psalm 119, beginning at verse 10. I'm going to read from Eugene Peterson's translation called The Message. I'm single-minded in pursuit of you. Don't let me miss the road signs you've posted. I've banked your promises in the vault of my heart, so I won't send myself bankrupt. Be blessed, God. Train me in your ways of wise living. I'll transfer to my lips all the counsel that comes from your mouth. These words hold me up in bad times. Yes, your promises rejuvenate me. I skipped a page. I apologize. I delight far more in what you tell me about living than in gathering a pile of riches. I ponder every morsel of wisdom from you. I attentively watch how you've done it. I relish everything you told me of life. I won't forget a word. Amen. Gotta love it when things are new and different. Since the pandemic struck, fortunately, we've been able to continue worshiping because of technology. We've been able to worship together from all of the various places that you have been. And today is that first time gathering since March 22nd. Amazing. But it is a joy to be back in Covenant Sanctuary worshiping God together. And whether you are here today in person or whether you are worshiping from wherever you may be, I'm overjoyed again that we are gathered at Christ's invitation to glorify God so that we may truly ponder every morsel of wisdom from God and relish everything God has told us of life. Well, over the last four weeks, we have been in a sermon series entitled Stepping Stones for the Journey. With each stepping stone, we've celebrated how God has provided to us in a constant gift, faith, peace, love, hope. And by keeping these gifts ever before us on the forefront of our minds and in our hearts, we are informed of how we will walk into tomorrow. This sermon series has reframed my own perspective, opening my ears more to where and how God is speaking, and widened my gaze to see where God is at work, that I may come alongside God. Well, our stepping stone for today is joy. And those of you who are born and bred Presbyterians might remember the question from the Shorter Catechism, what is the chief end of humanity? And the answer, to glorify God and Enjoy God forever. For the Christian, joy is a direct response to the love of God in Christ Jesus. These stepping stones have informed me, reminded me, that in God I know who I am and whose I am. The pandemic, it has struck and affected so much of our lives these past few months. And when it first struck, especially on that March 29th, Caressa and I were scrambling to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. We had to rethink everything that we were used to doing in worship. We made quick decisions and re-navigated so many different aspects of our life, probably much like you did. We had to rethink how we would be parenting as well as schooling our children at home. We had to rethink how we would clean our hands and our clothes when we would come into the house from other locations. We had to rethink how we would be ministers. We had to rethink how we would lead worship. We did what needed to be done for the safety and the well-being of community, especially the most vulnerable among us. But when life gets turned upside down, you have to eventually put it back And when you put things back together, it's very rare they go back the exact same way they came apart. We have to answer questions that we have answered before. We have to rethink and reconsider those questions so that we can provide the new correct answer. Oftentimes, we find new answers to those basic questions that are essential to living. Questions like, who or what defines you? an identity question. Who or what tells you who you are? There's many ways in society that we answer that identity question. 
do you define yourself by what you do, by your job? You could be a teacher, an investment banker, an administrative assistant, a police officer, a lawyer, a scientist, a musician, a full-time volunteer. You could be a teacher. You could be a student. And this is all something that you do, but it doesn't tell you who you are. Perhaps you define yourself these days by your relationship to another, the relationship, the major role you play in the life of another person. You're a sister or a brother, you're a father or a mother, you're a spouse, a friend, a caregiver. You can be one or more of those titles at the same time. That doesn't tell you who you are. It could be that some of you are in a season of life where you might define yourself by what you are no longer. You are no longer someone who works. You are no longer someone who has kids at home. Or you're no longer married couple with no kids. You are no longer someone who's in good health. You're no longer someone whose parents are living. And while it is not so much who you are, but who you are no longer, that frames your understanding, it's still not who you are. Identifying who we are is not a new question. And Jesus addresses, he focuses on the identity question in his words to the disciples in this chapter. John. Now allow me to set the scene for you. By this point, the disciples have been with Jesus for quite some time. Many biblical scholars say at least three years. They have traveled with him, feasted with him, listened to his teachings. They have witnessed the signs and wonders. And now, on this night, all is finally quiet. It's late. The crowds are gone. The fire is burning low. And Jesus is speaking intently to his disciples, to his closest, dearest friends. He is speaking with teaching after teaching and lesson after lesson and sermon after sermon. So let us listen for God's word to us as it comes from the 15th chapter of John, beginning at verse 1. I'll read from the New Revised Standard Version. I am the true vine. My father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Biblical scholars call this section of John's Gospel, chapters 13 through 17, the farewell discourse. Discourse because Jesus' words just keep coming like a verbal dissertation. And farewell because the very next day Jesus will be betrayed, arrested, face trials, and it is the cross and the grave that await him. Soon he will be gone from the disciples' presence, and on this last night, Jesus offers them guidance, offers wisdom. He hopes will sustain them through what is to come. Wisdom, like serve one another. Believe in God. Trust you are not abandoned. Love one another as I have loved you. I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me. Reside in me, make a home in me, find your place in me as I abide, reside, make, am at home in, and reside in you. 
I envision this scene with the disciples getting nervous and glancing back and forth at one another because they knew something was up. Jesus' behavior was not normal, not even for Jesus. Jesus keeps going on and on with his many sermons, but they did not, could not fully realize all that was coming. But Jesus knew. And that's why, according to John, Jesus spent the last night of his life reminding the disciples of their identity. He did that, not by giving them a job description, not by linking them back with their nuclear families. Oh, you are a father, you're a husband, you're a daughter, you're a wife. Not by telling them what they needed to believe. Jesus told them who they were. He identified and connected with them. He connected them to who he is. I am the true vine. My Father is the vine grower. Abide in me as I abide in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from the vine, the branches can do nothing. Jesus is creating imagery of this interconnectedness, describing how his friends are connected to him and how interconnected they are to one another already. And notice Jesus didn't say, you need to become part of the vine. You need to graft yourself to the vine. You need to believe yourself into becoming part of me. No, Jesus stated this connectivity, this connection as a present reality. I am the vine. You are the branches. And notice, even when Jesus spoke about how all branches need to be pruned from time to time for their health and their growth, he made a specific point to alleviate the fear of pruning, to let the disciples know they had already been pruned, or cleansed, as our translation put it. It's the same verb. Whenever they were rebuked, taught, corrected, guided, or witnessed Jesus' performing a sign or a wonder by hearing God's word of faith, peace, love, hope, and joy, they were being cleansed by Jesus, who is the word. Because you are connected to me, Jesus says, it is not possible to not produce fruit. There is no need to be anxious. The pruning is already happening in order to produce more fruit. Now later, Jesus goes on to say, you did not choose me, I chose you. In other words, on that last night of his life, it was important to Jesus to make sure that they heard, to make sure that we hear there was nothing They needed to do in order to earn being connected to Jesus, the true vine. There is nothing we need to do to be worthy of being a branch. For being a branch connected to the vine will produce fruit. That's just who they were, just as it is who we are. That closeness, that intimacy, that connectedness to God in Jesus is already established. And that truth meant they were and we are free to live and produce fruit. Now, I heard another preacher, the Reverend Dr. Johnston, link this closeness, this intimacy, this connection to the vine and the branches to another story in the Gospel of John, the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus in chapter 3. And Jesus tells Nicodemus that his disciples will be born again, or born from above, or born of the Spirit. It depends on how you translate. The image of the baby in the womb is a parallel image to the branch on the vine. Stay with me. The baby in the womb is connected to her source of life, her mother, by the umbilical cord, a human vine, if you will. The mother, the source of her life, is all around her, providing the space and the nutrients for growth. The baby does not believe in the mother. The baby's only reality is the mother. Similarly, in this section of John's Gospel, Jesus is trying to open the eyes of the disciples to see they are connected to God in the same way. They, we, are connected to God, the source of life, to Jesus himself, like a branch is connected to a vine, like a baby is connected to the mother. Just as the mother surrounds the unborn child, so God surrounds us. Just as the vine causes sap to flow outward to the branches, providing the nutrients for growth and for flourishing, so God does within us. I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus proclaims. This is who you are, regardless of your job, regardless of your role in the lives of others, regardless of who you used to be, for good or for ill. 
I am the vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. Make your home in me. Remain in me. Draw your life from me. Realize you are surrounded by me. This is your truth. Not because of how good and worthy you are, but because of how good and how worthy God is. I am the vine. You are the branches. Who you are and whose you are is rooted in God. Jesus spent the last night of his life hoping to plant the true seed of their identity deep within them, trusting that it would grow and bloom so that they would remember their true, actual identity, who they were no matter what happens. I suspect that Jesus knew they needed to hear these words before their world got turned upside down. When Jesus was crucified and buried, Their world got turned upside down. The disciples forgot who they truly were and to whom they belonged. Some tried to return to being known only by what they had done, their job as fishermen or tax collectors. Some tried to be known by their roles in the lives of others as they returned to being a father or a wife or a daughter. I can imagine there were also those who defined themselves by what they were no longer. Disciples who used to follow Jesus instead of who they are now in Jesus. As disciples of Jesus, we are claimed as God's own. With each breath, we receive the nutrients of God's life as a branch connected to the true vine. And you are nothing less than a child of God. You belong to God. That truth surrounds us and nourishes so that we will produce I imagine right about now you're wondering, you know, preacher, the stepping stone for today is joy, and you have been talking about identity. Thank you. Perfect time for a segue. The first 10 verses of John 15 explain to the disciples then and now the answer to the identity question, who we are. And when we know who we are and whose we are, there is joy. As I said earlier, for the Christian, joy is a direct response to the love of God in Jesus Christ. As a branch connected to the vine, we receive the love of of God in Christ Jesus, and joy is the result. Joy is manifested in our lives. The language of pruning and cutting off and burning may sound fierce, but all of us, every single one of us, have been pruned, and are being pruned already. You know those times when you've recognized a bad habit or a bad pattern, a destructive behavior, or there's that friend in your life, friend in your life, who draws you away from Christ, and you finally say, no more. That's pruning. In those times, you're choosing to sin less, which is another way to say that you are pruning yourself to receive Christ's resurrected life. When you draw closer to Christ, you are pruning aspects of your life that allow you to draw even closer to Christ. And when you receive fully God's Spirit through the vine, your eyes, ears, heart, and life will increase your joy. Drawing your life from Christ is where your joy begins, so your joy may be complete. Jesus tells the disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you. Abide In my love, I am the vine, you are the branches. As we accept this identity, we abide in Christ, remain in Christ, make our home in Christ. And Christ abides in us. That is who we truly are. And that is our joy. Let us pray. Lord of the true vine. In you we live and move and have our being. We we are your branches. And we need your life as as well as we need your pruning. So that the fruit that we produce may be in abundance. May our lives be full of fruitfulness. May our lives be fully connected to you. That joy may abound. Amen.